Um, I'm going to hand off to Linda uh, after she's read her piece. Uh, um, this is a poem I wrote, and I read it at the very last rhyme show. Okay. Called Ode to the Rhyme Show. Once I was a wandering poet, stumbling in and out of random dark rooms. Then I entered the basement of Three of Cups Lounge, wrote my name on the list, sat on an empty bar stool in the back of the room, downed a few cans of PBR and watched the open mic. When my name was called, poetry papers trembled in my hand. My heart pounded, my voice cracked. I was barely able to get my words to transmit before the microphone before me. Yet the audience was attentive and politely applauded. I felt welcomed, so I kept coming back and the world continued to spin around. It wasn't just me. Others agreed, this ancient mariner ran a good show. A military man, he always started on time. He canvassed other venues citywide, searched for undiscovered talent to feature, and he pulled it together in an artistic nurturing slurry. Every last Wednesday of the month, poets came to share their craft, the puzzle pieces of writing life. In this space, you could hear a doctor who recites Seuss-like rhymes, see performers burst into song. Here you could see a grown man shout about the joys of junk college girls dancing. And sometimes you could hear French poetry that you knew was so sexy, even if you couldn't translate a single word. Once I was a wandering writer, rolling through the East Village and the winds of fate brought me here. It soon became my poetic home. Today, we celebrate the fifth anniversary of the Rhyme Show in this basement of an Italian restaurant soon closing. Is this the last Rhyme Show? Where will the writers go? Thank you, everybody. Blair, are you there? I saw her here. I just asked to unmute her, and now it seems like she disappeared. Blair? Hello. Hello, hello. There she is. There we go. I guess my headphones didn't have a mic on them. Um, I'm going to stay on stop video because I have really weird, shitty lighting, and it's not going to be helpful. Um, all right. George was quite comfortably fucked up at his regular dive, but something wasn't sitting right inside. All the other regulars were here. He had command of the record player. It was the same Friday night he'd had a million times over, but something was missing and he knew exactly what it was. Suzanne hit the road that morning and he ached missing her. He hated to acknowledge it. 30 years old and he'd watched all his peers pass him by. He'd been to five weddings this fall. Everyone had good jobs and good looking kids and here he was watching the takeout bags and beer cans pile up around the nightstand in his childhood bedroom. He'd moved home after college to look after his mother, once a vibrant powerhouse of a woman who in the wake of his father's disappearance had been reduced to a life of gallon vodka jugs, unfiltered cigarettes and episodic hysteria. Tonight she was on a tear, so he stayed out. 30 years old, no direction. 30 years old and his hands already shook until he'd put back a few. One thing had changed recently though. He had this chick hanging around. George had been alone a long time, but his buddy died last April and left a whole lot of pretty women in need of comfort. So he took up with one of them. Nearly a year later, they were still at it. Suzanne had a lot of feelings to work out and he didn't mind one bit her doing so on his dick. It was a relationship seated in despair, but they had in fact come to love each other, so none of that really mattered. You'd think they'd be a funny looking pair. He was an easy five inches shorter and she had about 40 pounds on him, but they spent most of their time sitting on bar stools or laying in bed, so the aesthetics didn't really make that much of a difference either. Anyone who stumbled across them could tell they had a fine old time. You make me feel like, I don't know, like a man, I guess. He remembered a few nights before, taking a drag off a joint and staring up at her. She was topless, straddling him. I, I feel like I could actually do something for myself, you know? Like maybe when I come down to New Orleans, I just won't leave. 
just stay, play music and eat and fuck. Well, I'll help you get set up. Suzanne took back the joint and leaned forward to lay her breasts over his face. They continued their high, lazy play. I know people down there. You'd be happy. I'm happy. You have no idea. Fuck New York anyway. He wrapped his arms around her waist and flipped her onto her back, burying his face in her neck and in her startled laughter. You're right. I'll be there by Fat Tuesday. Loosing himself from the memory, George throws back a shot of whiskey and eyes a trembling hand. Fuck, I gotta fix that. They say it at the same time, a thousand miles apart. It's 2 a.m. on a dark stretch of I-59 just below Hattiesburg and Suzanne's hands are shaking too. The tires on her little jalopy are bald and the alignment is bad enough that it's fucking up the steering. Driving is a lot more effort than it was a month ago. They'd argued the night before she left, before and after the fucking. They didn't argue often, but when they did, it was always about the same thing. He wasn't ready for their relationship to get more serious, and she wasn't keen on being reminded. She'd left New York to get her head together after a string of misfortune and was way more invested in George than she wanted to be. He was the only thing bringing her back around. It wore heavy on her mind as she tore down the highway. In the bathroom, George digs a key into a tiny plastic bag and thinks about the unwitting lie he told her. I'll see you in New Orleans, he'd said as she grabbed her suitcase, eyes glistening. I'll miss you till you get there, she'd offered. Yeah, I know. He ain't gonna see her in New Orleans. His will to fulfill promises keeps disappearing up his left nostril. Back at his beer now, George knows he'll never make it south. He wants to. He wants to make her happy. He wants a shot at his own happiness, but he won't make it. She'll get over it. I'll see her soon enough. She'll forgive me. With a sudden and sickening clunk, the right, the right front tire ejects itself from the wheel well. Suzanne is working the tired out of her eyes at the site at the time and doesn't have time to gasp, let alone troubleshoot. The jalopy careens into the ditch at 80 miles an hour and flips. Dazed, she pulls herself from the wreckage and into the beam of her headlights, fumbling for her phone, but she's dizzy and tired and so sinks to her knees, eventually laying her head down in the wet grass, soothed by its coolness against the humidity of a Mississippi night. Blood mixing with the green under the golden headlight beam prompts loose a pained sigh. She's gonna let go. Just let herself dream about Mardi Gras. Another hour and a few more shots and George will be doing the same. Thank you. I'm sorry, <laughs> I think I'm, I'm, saying, I, I'm saying I see you're unmuted. Go ahead, Francine. Yeah. And I'm yeah. muted, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, all Francine. Uh, next up, thank you very much. Thank all right, you. thank you. Um, so hi, everybody. Um, this is called Send. Yes, my text only lover, I have a life and it's not about you. It's not about you and me holding hands, IRL. It's not about the clammy vinyl of car seats on hushed summer nights. There was a time when romance was an open mouth waiting to taste the moon, but like one breath making room for the next breath things have to move on. The cascade of emoji hearts is no longer enough. But don't worry, I will store it in the archives. And when I die and detectives search my phone for clues, they will find you. Then they can relax their clenchy shoulders, nod at one another and agree that yes, it appears that I was loved. Thank you very much, Francine. Mm -hmm. Next up is Ember Flame, but I don't see her here. Ember, if you're here, please unmute yourself and let us know. Um, otherwise, next up after that is Madeline Ottenberg. So, Ember. Um, yes, sorry, I'm here. I, uh, oh, here I don't, you are. Yeah, I don't have my stage name on my video, sorry. Okay, welcome, Ember. Thank you. All the way from Australia, uh, right? Yes, yeah, from Sydney. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, this poem is called The Drop. I'm sitting on a little ledge, swinging my legs 
swinging my legs off the edge. The drop beckons like a lover calling, hello, my darling, you big brawny, you clear morning, you voluptuous excess. It tells me what I am, it is, a place where I can die, dig about and feel my depth. Yes, there is an inkling, a dim star in my belly, but fear is a force field between me and the black, black, glittering abyss. I stroke all my things, machine made stuff with sharp edges, gathering dust. I'm running out of space up here, yet I'm still so greedy to fill it up. I yearn to unsquish, to be loose and limbless, but I'm stuck sweating over false choices, dripping divine sweat onto the small stuff. My legs swing bravely, but my good cop, bad cop is our backs against the wall, sensing their annihilation in the bigness beneath. It's a terrible temptation to think I can be as boundless as love, that I'm both brittle and brawn, brittle and brawn, brawn and brittle. I clench my hands and say, I'm not ready to be the gnarled tree and savannah plains, to read the hieroglyphics of my heart in clay mortal cliffs, but I'm still swinging my legs, swinging my legs off this edge. And I have pins and needles as I inch closer to that sweet, perfect, bottomless pit. Thank you, Amber. And next up we have Madeline Ottenberg. Thank you, Linda. Congratulations, everyone. This is Guardians of the Good. I had a hundred unhappy men under me who never had a woman boss, certainly not a slight girl. Openers, verifiers, packers handled incoming mail for US customs. When I spoke, they cat whistled and wiggled their middle fingers at me. After the floor captain grabbed a cache of videotapes off conveyor belts, Men jammed into the projection room, examined them for anything beyond missionary. I heard their braying, kept to my office, cataloging pornography by violation and country of origin, Denmark, Denmark. Sweden, Holland. When the floor captain burst through my office, licking his lips, he slapped the day's haul of magazines on the desk took bets on my stammer and blush. After a while, I slept with one eye open while America rested easy. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline, that was great. Danva Butson is up next, everybody. Hi, this poem is called In Which You Were Homesick. In which you were homesick homesick for a time when it was still possible to get lost, in which we have learned anything. We haven't learned it from this phrase book, in which there were horses running through the sunlight as if we didn't have a choice to not believe in beauty, in which you were dreaming of things falling, and when you woke up, things were falling, in which a man who looked like he slept in an ashtray paced back and forth in the corner with a smoking briefcase laughing and shaking his head and then put the briefcase down and walked away while it drizzled confetti, even though there was no parade, in which there was a chalice at your breakfast table and she was lovely and you were 21 and you, you have no idea whatever happened to her, in which you were sleeping and then you woke up and there was suddenly Chicago through the windshield, in which your father was dying and decided to fall out of an airplane and you were certain that he would do something to make sure that his chute didn't open, but it did. And he stood up and started telling dirty jokes all over again, as if he hadn't just fallen through the clouds. In which you swim and you swim and you swim, and you still don't know if you really know how to swim. In which a line of people is walking toward the horizon, and some of them are joining the line without knowing why. And one of them says, even if we get to that horizon, there will be another one farther out. What then? in which you had been making out for so long in someone's basement that your tongue hurt and you thought your jeans might be worn smooth at the crotch, in which the conductor of this train dreams of becoming an astronaut 
and is quite sure that his wife is having an affair with his sister, in which the ocean is always the ocean, even if we act as if there is no ocean out there, in which there is an abandoned house just off the highway, and there is a windmill next to the house, and after you climb over the barbed wire fence and walk around the cow patties and step through what was once the front door of the house, you announce, honey, I'm home, and you feel like you are indeed our home for the first time in a long time in which there are dishwashers dreaming of becoming poets and poets washing last night's dishes and the same cardinal is outside both of their windows in the morning singing, am I alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. In which here continues the long slow lesson of the loneliness that seems to have no beginning, that seems to have no end. Thank you. Thank you, Denver. Next up we have Susan Young. Go ahead, Susan. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, I call this suburbanizing Lower East Side. In 1972, I had been a cultural worker for Basement Workshop, a nonprofit community cultural arts center in Chinatown with 50 other Asian American artists. Contrary, I became an activist by initiating the Confucius Plaza demonstrations in 1974 so that garment and restaurant workers can ascertain better jobs in the construction businesses. We succeeded with 40 Asian workers in construction. Later, I helped renovate an 8,000 square feet raw loft space into an arts institution presently in the Museum of Chinese in America called MOCA. At that time, we had workshops in writing, dance, theater, darkroom, and archival materials. Now MOCA only exhibits old stuff. I even curated the first Asian American exhibit in New York City, performed at Charis on 9th Street, read poetry at New Eureka Poets Cafe with Lois Elaine Griffith, I think we might have lost Susan. Susan, you accidentally muted yourself. Susan, oh. Susan, you got muted somehow. Are you there still? Yeah, okay. Sorry. So where am I? <laughs> Go back a line or two. Oh, um, performed at Charis on 9th Street, read poetry at New Eureka Poets Cafe with Lois Elaine Griffith, participated and documented a gathering of the tribes until their big move from East 3rd to East 6th Street, worked with Ron Neal's Banana Pudding Jazz at New Eureka Poets Cafe and read at Bowery Poetry Club curated a woman's art show at Bullet Space, group show at 123 Rivington Gallery, where I met Bobby Watlington, a black artist where I, we read at Three of Cups, Ancient Mariners, Open Mic. On the day of my induction as a silver tongued devil, there also was an important event for Basement Workshop's 45th year reunion held in Tribeca's fancy restaurant by Asian American Arts Alliance. I had to be there to promote Asians in mainstream arts. First, I showed up in Tribeca to introduce my guest, Ed Premis, nephew of Pearl Premis, an African anthropologist and had taught Alvin Ailey African Movement to the Asian commun cultural community. Ed's daughter had learned Chinese where a conflict had erupted with a corrupt principal. He needed judicial support and began mingling among the Asians as well as take photos. I left and quickly grabbed a taxi during rush hour. It was the slowest red light ride to Lower East Side. I showed up in my fancy really dressed, wearing a Tibetan necklace, and read for 15 minutes my Trump story. I quickly returned to Tribeca with another slow taxi ride. 
there I realized Ed had a problem getting seated among the Asian men. He was about to leave. After musical chair maneuvers, Ed finally got to sit next to a dynamic lawyer. Phew, I was able to relax with Asian entertainment, good wine, and a steak dinner. These past five years, I have been associated with non-Asians and Blacks. I spent most of my life blending in a diverse Lower East Side community, explaining its diverse foods, the subcultures of squatter living, the problems of closing small businesses and nonprofit arts organizations. This when the stratify ostracisms between whites and minorities in an overdeveloped community has broadened. Once upon a time, the war on poverty was expressed with murals depicting social changes for working class families as shown in Marlies Mombe's Viva Losada video. Now, this duality of being American born and foreign is a perpetual competitive battle to become a mainstream artist. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And next up, we have C.O. Moed. And then after C.O. Moed, we have Beth Corliss and Lamont. Last night, it was the usual fist fight. My older sister punching my mother as hard as she was getting punched. And I don't know how it all got started. I was sitting on my bed, which is where I usually sit when I watch people beating the fuck out of one another. As if each punch was the road to being loved or being heard or being whatever, when suddenly, my mother got wild, got wild. I don't know how she could have pushed my sister even deeper into the corner of the bed, but she did. And I watched her grab my sister's head and begin bashing it, bashing it uncontrollably against the wall, uncontrollably over and over and over and over. And like she had exploded at a billion miles an hour into a monster with no brain, ravenous, and tearing apart. And my father, who never intervened because fist fights made him crippled again. His wife, filling up with the ghost of his father, the ox. There was no winning when the ox pummeled him into the ground. My father went and married the ghost of the ox. And even if she was beautiful, and even if he did love her very much, and even if she loved him, maybe, he could never stop her even when he was still hitting her or she was hitting him until one day he just decided to stop hitting everyone. And my father who never intervened ran into our small bedroom where I was sitting on my bed, which is where I usually sit when people were beating the fuck out of one another. And I watched him for the first time pull the ghost of his father off his daughter who sobbed sobbed uncontrollably because even though her father loved her she only loved the woman beating the fuck out of her i don't remember for sure but i did something maybe for the first time i took my wool poncho and i closed the front door behind me maybe i was 12 perhaps i was 13 it was definitely winter and i walked to essex and grand and i got on the avenue a bus the bus driver let me smoke his cigarettes as we traveled uptown in the middle of the night talking about family. He let me off at St. Mark's and I walked maybe for the first time, but definitely not the last, into a brutal cold, looking for home and a break from monsters. 20 years later, watching Jurassic Park in a movie theater, I would panic terror that had nothing to do with dinosaurs. And 20 years after Jurassic Park, I would ask my sister about that night. And she would say, she didn't remember. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Theo Moed. Next up, we have Beth Corliss Lamont. Unmute yourself, Beth. You have to click the little button and unmute yourself. Do it, just click it one time. Oh, 
There you go. Yep, we got it. Go ahead. Yes, you're on. I'm on. All right. Honored to be among a published, <laughs> other published poets. And I want to brag about my shirt before I start my poem. Can you see it? No. Nope. Nope, nope, nope. Well, you gotta stand up. Right. Gotta stand up. This says lefties are in their right minds. And since I have a mistaken name, I'm not Corliss. Corliss, I married Corliss. And he wrote way back in 1939, you might like socialism. <gasps> and I updated it and called it my name. Lefties are in their right minds. And I believe we're really uh, coming. I know we're not supposed to advertise, but I want to sing. I hope I can sing my song. And this is Hibernating Heart. You hear me all right? Yes. All right. If I get croaky, I'll just read it. <laughs> oh, celebrate here and now. No. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm singing the wrong song. Oh, sweetheart, cold and lonely is the winter. Enchanted earth beneath her blanket sleeps so still. Breezes moan laments of empty sadness and thunder grumbles discontented on the hill. Golden summer sky has turned to silver and etched upon it silhouettes of naked trees. Gone are love and life and warmth and laughter. And now I huddle by my hearth of memory. I almost got it. <laughs> Could our eternal moment be all through? Perhaps love lies asleep to wake anew. All all alone and afraid. Oh, sweetheart, I need you so. Hand to hold, <laughs> heart to trust. Where you are, there I must go. Nature's trust in kindly fate leaves hope within my hibernating heart. Dormant, dreaming love awaits the prom promise of a new start, tinkling melody of sparkling water, need the irreverence of skaters lies entombed. Swallows flown, their cradle rocks abandoned, and barren branches left where lovely roses bloomed. So lavish with our endless summer treasure, Yet inescapable as winter that we part. Sweetheart, where's your magic kiss of springtime? Come, wake the world and wake my hibernating heart. <laughs> Thank you, Beth. That was lovely. Thank you. And next up, we have Susan Wyman. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Okay, so I'm going to read my original roommate story, which is really a story. <laughs> roommate. Oh, I'm nervous. Yes, that's the Someone unmuted? Okay. Roommates. Nine roommates in 11 years. Looking for another roommate was a drag. What could I do? I opened my Mac. Clicked on my roommate file. Go ahead, Susan. I, I, she's muted. Go ahead, Susan. What? What happened? Go ahead. It's working. Oh, all right. Um, thanks. Young women looking to save money who had never stepped foot outside of Manhattan came to Astoria in droves. They arrived early when it was still light. It's ahead, cute, Susan. different. Looks not wait. Linda, what's why do you keep saying yes. that? Can you not? My see? internet, I think, is going in and out. It's very windy here. I think that my internet is getting affected by uh, all the wind outside. Okay. Go ahead. All right. I'm going to start over. 
I apologize. Roommates, nine start again. I'm sorry. 11 years. Looking for another roommate was a drag. What could I do? I opened my Mac, clicked on my roommate file, and posted my ad on Craigslist. Young women looking to save money who had never stepped foot outside of Manhattan came to Astoria in droves. They arrived early when it was still light. It's cute, different, looks nothing like Manhattan. How safe is it? Where's the grocery store? One woman asked to see the laundry room that was located in the basement. It was early evening and the cold gray cinder block room was empty. I could see that she was extremely uncomfortable when she broke out in a cold Manhattan sweat. Another came with a list of questions from Columbia University Housing and proceeded to interrogate me. Is it safe, she asked for the third time. As I walked her to the corner, the homeless man who sits in front of the laundromat approached her. Hey, sweetie, you wanna get married? I got food stamps. Francesca rescheduled three times. She was young, large, and luscious. The redhead spent two hours on my maroon sofa debriefing me. She was an assistant at a downtown real estate firm, a plus size model who was writing a book, making radio appearances, and was recently selected to star in a reality TV show. I don't want you to be surprised when you see ads with my face plastered all over the subway. I knew I would find someone. Evening spent at home, waiting, cleaning, schlepping my roommate's garbage bags of clothing. Repeating the same questions over and over was driving me nuts. Do you work full time? Have you lived with a roommate before? Do you have a partner? Do you own a TV? If so, would you mind watching it in your bedroom? That night, Lola called. Listen, I'm 52. I work full time and I'm a graduate student. I hope the age isn't a problem because I'm sick of being rejected by 20 year olds. Could it be true? We made an appointment for that evening. Lola arrived an hour late. She had a great smile and a mass of beautiful curly bronze hair. Unlike the others, she headed directly to the kitchen, dropped her bags and began to talk. We bonded immediately. We both loved Tom Wolfe, Salvador Dali, and had seen the death of a salesman with George C. Scott. We spoke at length before she asked to see the bedroom. It's perfect. She spent half hour drawing diagrams and describing how she would furnish the room. This was it, roommate at first sight. I was about to pop the question when she asked if she could charge her phone. I'm sorry, she said, I love your apartment and I really enjoyed meeting you, but I made this appointment earlier and must go. I'll be in touch soon. I felt betrayed. I spent two hours with this woman and thought I had a catch. The following day, she called as if I was, while well, I was interviewing another candidate. I'm in the neighborhood. May I stop by with my best friend? Can you make it at 7.45? Yes, she said. Are you sure, I asked. She arrived at 7.45 on the dock. Instead of her friend, she brought her mother, Dominique. When Dominique spoke to me in her broken English, Lola exploded. Mommy, Kayate, I told you not to talk. Lola opened every kitchen cabinet. She looked in the refrigerator and under the sink. With no warning, she pulled out her camera to photograph the apartment. You can photograph the bedroom, I said, but that's it. She tested each window, knocked on the walls and measured the room from corner to corner. I'd like to have the room painted, the ceiling scraped, and I want the closet next to my bedroom. The room will be painted, I replied, but the closet is mine. We returned to the kitchen and she began calculating her finances out loud. So Lola, what do you say? I love it, but I wasn't expecting to find a place so soon. I have to pay my school tuition this week 
and don't have enough money to cover the rent and security. How much is it? She was stalling. You only have to pay the security deposit and pay the rent when you move in. Can I give it to you next Friday? I'll help you, Lola, Dominique chimed in. No, mommy, I don't want your help. Lola, it's the middle of the month. If you don't take it now, I'll continue to look. I need to rent it. She did a few more calculations. Let me figure out a few things and I promise to call you tomorrow morning. The next day, I found a roommate. Everything is hunky-dory. We are in the honeymoon stage. In a few weeks, she will stop cleaning the apartment. And in a year or so, she will find a boyfriend, go to graduate school, or want her own apartment. Yes, you do have to kiss 100 frogs to find a roommate. My advice, keep kissing and ask the essential questions. If you don't, you will find out anyway. Are you a Republican? Do you own a boa constrictor? Do you watch American Idol? Do you sing along? Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Next up, we have Barbara Ann Branca. Can you hear me? Am I unmuted? Hi. Yes, yes, you are, yes. Yes. It's a beautiful thing. You got it. Thank you all. It's great to see Hello. you. Hello. Welcome. La Luna. La Luna. Declination. She declined. He asked her 12 times. She declined every time. He was just a waning moon. She was a winter sun. Rays wan, not wanton. She was all angles heard on high. Eyes at odds with that mouth, that mouth. She spoke in thunder. Silver tongue slicing sliver moon. After solstice, his soul stitched. To try again, they must wait till equinox, equal knox. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara Ann. And next up, we have Anton Yakolev. Hello. Thank, Hello. You, Mr. Thank you, Philip and Anthony. Um, been an inspiring afternoon, and I'm, I'm really honored to be part of this anthology and this reading. So. Um, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, Nikita Khrushchev pounded his shoe on the podium and said famously, we will bury you, and also less famously, I'll show you Kuiska's mother, which basically meant, I'll show you the worst hell you can imagine. So uh, that's, the poem is not entirely about this, but um, that is the reference at the end of the poem. Cold War Accessories. The seafront promenade is longer than childhood and spirals through all manner of fourth walls. We glide into the Baltic Sea to reach St. John the Divine. Classic dolls mill around its makeshift yard, interviewing each other. Some have learned 12 tone laughter. Those who do penance mostly stay out of view. Where did all the owls go? Their eyes used to comfort me. I will not rest until every letter you write resembles a bearded statue projecting a false security on what is essentially a castrated symphony. It always comes down to the death of stars, doesn't it? I will hammer my wooden clogs on your podium yet. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. Put you on. And next up, we have Melanie Seraf. Go ahead, Melanie. Hi, this is Copa. She is the only girl in class with a flower in her hair. And though it is not yellow nor feathered, I see Lola in her prime, 
before Rico, I see the smoke in Lola's cha-cha, which is altogether different in the hips from the dance she does for Tony on the empty dance floor. This girl is not Lola. She is nine and rapt watching her teacher's colored pencil merengue across the paper. The music is in her head and her fingertips waiting her turn, always waiting her turn. The flower, black and crystal, removed earlier that morning from the dog's misbehaving mouth, tells me she knows her turn is coming. And unlike the boy with his finger in his nose, she will be high heeled and ready for it. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. And next up we have John S. Hall. Hi, uh, this is called Invisible Dog. My dog is invisible, but he follows me around wherever I go. He takes invisible pisses on the lawn and my neighbor never knows. He takes a shit in the middle of the sidewalk and nobody sees and nobody cares and nobody notices when they step in it. He barks and only I can hear it. He does incredible tricks that only I can enjoy. He eats invisible food that I buy at the invisible supermarket with my invisible money that I make it my invisible job where I sit at an invisible desk doing nothing all day. When I come home, my dog wags his invisible tail and showers me with invisible kisses and I love the odorless smell of his invisible dog breath. My invisible dog is very, very old, but when he dies, it will be basically the same as it is now, as if he were still here with me. Thanks. Thank you, John. And um, next up, we have Stan Ripken. Can you hear me? Yes. We Yay. Can. If there is a God, that is a master and creator of everything in the universe, how can he possibly let himself be represented by the clowns who claim to be his followers? What would Jesus think of the people who call themselves Christians? Would he even recognize them as Christians? Or should one just call them Christoids? Not actual Christians, but a remarkable simulation. Now, if you were to observe Christoid public behavior, you might imagine that they practice a religion based on defending fetuses, and suppressing gay people. That's all they seem to have. They no longer feed the hungry, protect the weak, heal the sick, love their enemies, turn the other cheek, or any of that other stuff that Christianity used to be about. If Christ hadn't risen, as they say, he would be spinning in his grave over the nasty stuff being done in his name. These Christoids' existence should be evidence that there's no God, because if there was a God, he would have already smitten these people for ruining his brand name. What Christoids have done to the brand name Christian is what Coca-Cola execs did to Coke when they attempted to market new Coke. Now, Christoids will kill a doctor for performing an abortion, and a fetus is not a person and is more sacred to them than the doctor who is a person because they love the unborn but hate the previously born. They show God's love by torturing homosexuals. They said God told them not to sell wedding cakes to gay people. Well, what is it? Does God not like rainbow icing? Now, what is it that makes a cake gay? The little plastic figurines on top. So perhaps if we have every one of these bakers hand someone a bag with four figurines, two women, two men, and let the person who buys it decide whether it's a straight or gay cake. Now, Christians, they say they want their kids to have a religious exemption from anti-bullying laws in school. They want their children to be permitted to beat up gay kids in class because their practice of faith is beating up people. Now, they don't realize that a religious exemption from law could lead followers of another religion to demand their religious right to sacrifice a virgin as instructed by their invisible friend. Now, I remember when we were told that monotheism was a more advanced form of religious belief than polytheism, as if somehow having one imaginary friend was better than having a bunch of imaginary friends. Why is it less sophisticated to say, my God lives in the river, or my God is the sun, than to say, my God sits in a golden throne in a cloud-filled palace? A real Jehovah would be embarrassed at the collection of nasty loons worshiping him. All the other gods make fun of Jehovah when they get together. 
Zeus and Thor and Baal and all the forest and river gods shout across the celestial lunchroom, Yo, Jehovah, any of your followers blow up a mosque lately? The other gods mock Jehovah, calling him, Oh, he's the Mr. Mono in monotheism. Hey, Jehovah, tell Jesus to seek medical attention if his resurrection lasts longer than four hours. All right. If there really is a God of the universe on Judgment Day, I'll just point to his and say, look, how could I possibly believe you existed based on the quality of your adherence? So, and if he's really as great as they say, he'll give me a pass for having doubted his existence. So there is one thing we all can agree upon what religion says. And what I have seen is this is the unifying credo. Do what my invisible friend says, or I'll kill you. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for making this thing happen. Uh, and uh, don't like me on Facebook, like me on PayPal. <laughs> Thank you, Stan Rifkin. And next, I think Bert Baroff is ready to have his poem. Yes. yes, let's go. And he has his cat. Go, Bert. Am I unmuted? You're good. We could hear you loud and clear. Go ahead. It's amazing. It's good to know. To know is not one plus one is two. I know plus I know is not always I know. I sort of know of a fifth season ruled by unrelenting time, careening away. It's hard to keep pace. So many breaths in every step. I know I haven't tossed in the towel. I just need shorter three minute rounds. I know the number of time callers. I know we humans bud and bloom, but once reluctantly the flower wicks, inevitably the fragrance fades. I know we nurture niggardly. Truly, this perplexes me. I know a plate filled with me leaves me vanish. A plate filled with you nourishes my soul. Paradoxically speaking, to know is ego, all the glitter in all key notes. To know is as well knowledge, singing on the door. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bert. Glad you got that in. Um, we're up to, we were getting to the finishing line, folks. We have less than 10 people left to read, and I'm so grateful everybody's still hanging out who is still here. And next up, we have Deborah Clapp. Thank you. <clears throat> My anthology poem is called Reflection. I remember the night of moments with you. Together, we live these moments in moments where no time lives at all, where there is only the clearest round reflection, circle of light, oneness of being, luminous knowing, where the full bloom and the delicate bud knows the secret of every petal's unfolding, where the prince and the frog knows my kisses in the small rocks I throw, where the mother and the man in the moon knows us as the child needing to know. You said, look, pointing up to the moon. I looked up and saw pale yellow covered by gray cloud. It radiated up and out. Suddenly the gray cloud started moving diagonally down to the left. It quickly unveiled the clearest round reflection, circle of light, oneness of being, luminous knowing. Look, I cried, <clears throat> she's saying hello. Together we watched the revelation of the moon, a ceremony of recognition just for us. When she was all revealed, you said, it's nice to receive a telegram from way out in space. I smiled, knowing your heart, stop. As we walked to the path together, I said, we can remember that. You said, I already do. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Next up, we have Linda Lerna.
Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, this is um, this is from the anthology, and thank you, Linda, for doing this, and everybody involved. It's a wonderful, you know, program. Thanks Apple picking here. kisses, and this was written on my upcoming birthday after reading "Kiss Hierarchy" by Alexandra van der Kamp. August stalls in September. What can I do? Nothing moves. Half lit, yellowing stale like cigarettes from a Bogart film I want to stamp out one day after the next left to extinguish themselves and don't. My cat stretched out beside me on the couch, his green eyes opening just long enough to breathe in a grassy bird flying place with tiny figures whose faces I can't make out busy filling up baskets and mouths with 27 apples and kisses falling out of the sky and clothes before I can reach out to grab one. What's the point? I lie back imagining Thoreau painting a cool apple falling September day for me with kisses breaking out of apples and a 1940s leading male actor a cigarette dangling from his mouth, you know the one, coming toward me through a smoky haze. Thank you. Thank you, Linda Lerna. And next up we have John J. Trouse and then Bill Considine. Go ahead, John. Oh, you, there hey, you go. can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thanks. Thank you all. Thanks, Linda. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Murph, and thank you all. So I love Shirley Jackson. Mm -hmm. you know, this inspired by one of her novels. We have always. Nail a book onto a tree, memorize a word or three, bury coins and golden watches, curios and witchy swatches. Run around the yard and garden, let your heart and feelings harden tidy up the little hollow by the creek, both deep and shallow. Put the sugar in the cupboard, hide the watch behind the floorboard, entertain the guests at tea, memorize a word or three, store the books and don't return them. Someday you will have to burn them. Memorize a word or three. Someday you'll live merrily. And remember, come September, to be kind in May, November, even when the world's an ember and you are its only member. Thank you. Thank you, John. Very nicely done. And next up, we have Bill Considine. On mute. Yep, yes, go ahead. We hear you. Okay. Dark party. Poem begins after the dark party. The beer in the tub poured cold as nails. Strangers smirked in my barren study. The music of my dance blasted the guests to huddle in the far dim kitchen, cold. A tilly guest lit the oven, door open. Neighbors spoke boldly of my shock and trauma. A stud skirted woman smiled Behind the cold friend, I could not see to the door. Some of the guests stayed in their tiny homes and did not show their fear and confusion. Tight-lipped, I paced my railroad hall. This is fun, drinking friends demanded. I'll throw another soon, and a strange word will go round and round and round. Call it a success. Just do it. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. All right, next up we have Rivka Layla Reed. Rivka, are you, there you are. Go ahead. Uh, 10th Street at Hudson, 300 words out a window. Uh, 
I mean, he just turned shrill, said one to the other, walking out the door by my shoulder. A fairly small Starbucks, but with a few seats available for rent as I wait for my first audition. Taxis are so square, not, not, not on hip. Well, fuck Uber and the other hipster union busters. No, it's just that they're crossover SUVs now. Well, there go a couple of sedans to prove me wrong. <laughs> me? Wrong? I'm not wrong that that was a pretty blonde with a green and blue scarf tied to her bag strap. Hey, that's my trick to feel beautiful. Uh, so another three second one-sided love affair ends. Anyway, the gal in jeans and glasses who didn't say, isn't it too orange after dyeing her hair seems more my type. My type? What is that? What can that be if I'm still working on my type? Looking out the window, wanting pen, not laptop. Looking out, I'm charmed that there's reproduction going on. Some people have real hope for the future. I miss my non-existent grandchild, but I don't know what they would have to live through. There's a reason we die. I guess I'm not ready to finish this role. And besides, I have an audition in two hours. Thank you for letting me be part of it. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. All right, um, next up, um, I have a video of Pat Cristiano reading his video, reading his poem and um, I'm hoping with all my heart that it will work. The, the sound is a little bit low. So if I could ask everybody to make the volume on your side, on your computer as loud as possible. And um, you can hear him saying it, but it is a little bit low. So if you make your volume as loud as it could be. Um, this is for the one day. This is for the poet who ran out of ammo. This is for the poet who ran out of words started screaming one day. This is for the poet to stop screaming because who listens anyway? Or maybe just stop to listen for a moment. This is for the silent poet. This is for the poet disappointed in life or in love or in anything to the point of disappearing but returns. This is also for the artist, also the musician, for the cook and the dancer social worker, beautician. This is for the poet who returns to his world and his words, reassembles them carefully, completely alone. This is for the poet alone who rehearses his craft and rehearses his craft and rehearses his craft. But why not say nothing? And this is the picture of the poet on the back of her book, the one that was published to a sort of mild interest, and to her own surprise, she is standing in sunlight on the roof of her building, the one she didn't jump from. That was Pat Cristiano, and I, 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 you were able to hear it, right? Yes. Okay. All right. And we have three more people left. Next up, we have Christopher Grigsby. Moving along. Christopher. Hey. Hi. Can you all hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, I heard it was, it was requested that I wear the shirt. I know that Linda went through great pains to send it over. So, so here it is. Um, and I'm going to be reading my poem, uh, The Avenue. And uh, here we go. To think that it could come to this 
could cross one more right off your list, could cross one bridge into the night where right is wrong and wrong is right. To think that what is good is true, to walk that dreaming avenue, to think and feel and disregard what hurts too much and hits too hard, to jump and shout upon the thought that what we want is what we ought, that felt alone there still is love, and those who've gone are still above. To cast the past into the now, to crave the one that won't allow, to wonder who and why and how, and think it was all done by chance for heavy sighs and failed romance. To give a gift unto thine hand, to prostrate proud at thy command, to rise like phoenix when we stand for commonwealth, upon this land that we might build what we demand, that we may eat until we fill, that we shall leave and pay no bill, that we should dream of all of this and still no pain where we crave bliss, to make a list and check it twice, to feed the flame and pay the price, to think we see what's good and true of Pharaoh and of Ingenue, whose outlines you and I once knew as we dance into the blue <clears throat> along the Dreaming Avenue. Uh, thank you, uh, Linda and Philip and everyone for putting this together. Much appreciated. Thanks for being here, Christopher. All right, um, the last two poets we added just at the last minute and um, Nicole Acosta did not want to originally read and she agreed to read the poem in the book, which I was one of my favorites, I have to say. So here is Nicole, it's very clever. From 9-11 to 11-9, America just turned into one big locker room and I feel totally naked and afraid. We gave the biggest loser the voice. The hoarders and real housewives are playing storage wars. They're trading all their isms they hide beneath floorboards. We wish Ashton Kutcher would jump out of the bushes and tell us we just got punked but this is the real world and here comes Honey Boo Boo doing whatever he wants. I keep keeping up with the Kardashians. I don't feel like dancing up with the stars. I'm just a Nemo in a tank full of sharks. We're stuck in Gordon's worst kitchen nightmare with Pence as the apprentice. We're all extreme corp couponing because freedom is expensive. Join me on the next season of Survivor and I'm so glad that we survived those four years. Yes, Nicole, thank you for reading here today. And last, to read, and then I think Philip will say a few words to close the show out, is last is Peter Kozlowski. And thanks everybody for being here. It was so great to do this. It was really wonderful. And hopefully we'll have a live reading maybe in the summertime, maybe outdoors. And Peter, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, it's all you, Peter. Well, thanks Linda for all the work you do with the, the book and, and the readings and, uh, and the Zooms. And thanks, Philip, and everybody, and uh, Anthony. Okay, I heard a clock talk when I died. I heard a clock talk when I died. Well, not really. For one thing, I didn't die yet. And besides, I got rid of the clock that went talk. I had this clock that went talk. It was the rotary kind with a second hand that advanced in increments, and with every step, because of the resonance of the plastic housing in which it was mounted, it made a sound like talk. It didn't take long to conjure in my mind the idea I could get another clock of a similar design, but of a smaller size. And it would have made the same sound, but in a lighter register, thus providing the missing tick for this one's talk. They could have been a perfect match like soulmates or compliments like yin and yang. But the trouble is, neither of them is calibrated to a reliable standard. And they just drift in and out of sync. Going from total duet harmony to call and response and back again and around again. Can you imagine lying awake at night listening to that. With each stroke, each one is trying to get ahead of the other. And the battles of Tatak and Tatik <laughs> recall a long running argument that persists and can't quit. But the unaccompanied talk 
becomes evocative of the sound made by those funny shoes the women wear. They go clock, clock, clock when they go walking down the block. But there's a vast gulf between that kind of clock and, and sitting there listening to this thing going, talk, talk. It starts to sound like mock, mock, taunting me, what? Because I don't happen to have any of that kind of clockwork in my life right now, well, so what? I was usually always partial to the low heel types anyway. So away with this mock talk clock, I say. Out, damned talk. Let's take this outside and smash it. What a rock. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Peter. You. That was great. Now, Philip, I don't know if you want to say goodbye or whatever, and then maybe we'll all unmute ourselves and cheer really loudly for one another. Go ahead, Philip. Thank you, Linda. Um, I'm overwhelmed. Uh, you know, I, the words are beautiful in the book, but it was even better seeing my old friends again. What a joyous night for me. Thank you all. I love you. Good night. Thank you, Philip. Thank right, you, Philip. Unmute yeah. yourself and let's all everybody around the table. Oh, 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 great. Hey. Oh, thank you. Hey. Thank you. Hey. Thank you. Hey. Thank you. Hey. A lot of fun. Great poets. Very nice. Oh, great. Very nice. Very nice. Silver Top Devil. Silver Top Devil. Anthony. Hey. All right, I'm turning the recording off, guys. Okay. Okay. Oh.